Welcome back to Principles of Biology 1. <clears throat> Today we're going to uh, move on to another uh, group or category of organic compounds. And these are uh, a, a varied group that's called the lipids. Uh, the lipids include what we call the neutral fats, which are the fats and oils that we consume every day. Uh, we also have a, a weird group that are called the phospholipids that are very important. And uh, we usually find them in the membranes and cell membranes, the outer boundaries of cells. Another group we'll talk about are what are called the steroids. These are things like cholesterol, uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, aldosterone, cortisol, cortisone. Uh, these are all uh, examples of steroids, which is another type of lipid. <clears throat> There are some other ones. Uh, ones are called prostaglandins. One's called terpenes. Another group are called uh, waxes. Uh, it's a very, very diverse group. But the one characteristic about them is that generally they do not mix with water. Generally they are insoluble water, which means that they are mostly going to be hydrocarbons uh, and, and are nonpolar molecules. There are four basic uh, functions of lipids. Uh, particularly in, in animals, we find that where carbohydrates are for short-term storage, uh, lipids are really there for long-term energy storage, uh, which actually makes a lot of sense. Particularly, we'll find out that you can carry more calories of energy stored as a fat than you can with the same amount of carbohydrate or protein for that matter. Well, it turns out this is a very, very good concentrated form of energy. Right. Um, what you're seeing here on the right hand side is where we actually store that fat. Uh, that fat is stored in special cells called adipocytes. Adipose or is, is fat tissue. It's an incredibly specialized type of tissue in that uh, it is really well adapted to storing fat. You'll notice that most of the cell is for fat storage. In fact, uh, the nucleus and a lot of the organelles are pushed to the periphery. Fat is also very well vascularized, all right, and particularly we find that in skeletal muscle, uh, you might find quite a bit of adipose tissue. And there's a reason for that, mainly because uh, we have a lot of adipose tissue uh, because of, uh, of a certain type of muscle fiber type that uses uh, aerobic cellular respiration and very energy and endurance type muscles uh, sometimes have quite a bit of fat in them. The other thing that, uh, that fat is, is a function of is particularly good insulator. It is a terrible conductor of heat, so it really works great in, uh, in keeping things cold or keeping things warm. In the case of marine mammals like this walrus here, we find that marine mammals like whales and, and, uh, and walruses and seals and things like that often have big, big, thick layers of fat. We call that blubber. And it's wonderful to actually go and keep the animal warm. Now, before wetsuits, people discovered that if they coated themselves with a big layer of fat or grease, it also kept them warmer in the water. And you can see this triathlete here coated in grease. The other important thing about uh, about fat is that it is a fantastic cushion. A lot of our joints, a lot of our organs are surrounded by a protective layer of fat. So fat is a fantastic cushion. In fact, on the back of our kidneys, we have a layer of fat that actually helps attach the kidney to the body wall. Even in certain joints, for example, if we look at our knee, which has to withstand tremendous amount of compression, also has a little fatty pad in it. So 
fantastic cushion. The last thing is because fats and lipids are insoluble in water, they're fantastic for keeping water out, for waterproofing. For example, we often go and protect our cars from the corrosive nature of water by putting a thin layer of a lipid over the top. That's wax. Uh, a lot of animals will do this too. If you look at ducks, ducks have a, uh, a little gland at the end of their abdomen, all right, and it secretes a little oil. And you'll notice that ducks will reach back with their, their beaks, um, get a little drop of that oil, and then preen their feathers with that to make their their feathers waterproof. So those are the four main functions of lipids. Now, if you remember, the monomer of lipids are actually two. We're going to look at what are called the neutral fats to start off with. These are the fats and the oils. And their monomer actually has two monomers. They have a three-carbon molecule that's called glycerol. And that forms the backbone of the, the, uh, the polymer. What is attached to glycerol is a long chain of carbons and hydrogens. And this is called a fatty acid. So the two monomers of the neutral fats are glycerol and the fatty acids. If I had any kind of musical ambition and formed a band, that would be on the, my top 10 list for name of the band. I just think it has a great ring for a band. Glycerol and the fatty acids. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, glycerol, as you can see, is a three-carbon molecule. In fact, it's described as a three-carbon alcohol. By itself, it is soluble in water. And you might be wondering about the, the word glycerol sounds a lot like glycogen. And you'd be right, it has kind of a sweet flavor to it. Now, the fatty acids, as you can see, are long chains of carbons and hydrogens. And if you remember, carbons and hydrogens are so close together in electronegativity that they share their electrons fairly equally in the covalent bond. So that, a fatty acid, is pretty much going to be nonpolar nonpolar. You'll notice that on the right end we have carbon and three hydrogens on the right end of a fatty acid. That's the, the terminal end. And we call that a methyl group. Anytime you see CH3, that is a methyl group. And fatty acids all end in a methyl group. You'll notice that on the end that connects to glycerol, there's another functional group there. There is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then it has a bond to a hydroxyl group, oxygen and hydrogen. That carbon, oxygen, and hydroxyl group has a name. We call that a carboxylic acid group or carboxyl group. Now, that turns out to be really important because you might be wondering, why do we call this a fatty acid? Well, that carboxyl group or carboxylic acid group is the reason we call it an acid because that hydrogen that's part of that hydroxyl group has a tendency to dissociate. That hydrogen will often break off, leave its electron behind, and if you know, the definition of an acid is something that releases hydrogen ions in solution. And so in that case, that's why we call it a fatty acid, because of that carboxyl group, or carboxylic acid group, as, as the, the functional group is known. Now, fatty acids can range from just a few carbons clear up to longer and longer carbons. We find something really interesting about the length of the fatty acid chains. We find that among hydrocarbons, the longer the chain is, the more likely that the substance is going to be a solid. So if you look at things with just a single carbon or a couple of carbons, 
hydrocarbons, those are more likely to be a gas. Those are things like methane and propane and butane, all right? As you get longer, all right, then they become more liquid. That's stuff like gasoline, if you hear about octane. And then you have super long uh, hydrocarbon chains. You get things like paraffin wax and things like that that are a lot, uh, a lot longer. So when we take a look at fatty acids in the body, they range from anything from just a few carbons to things that are over 20 carbons on them. But on average, they're usually around maybe 16 to 18, uh, maybe up to 20 uh, uh, carbons in a fatty acid. Now, you'll see that we use exactly the same process for building our polymer. The polymer is called a triglyceride. Now, that makes sense. We have three fatty acid chains that bond to a glycerol. Tri just means three. All right. So here are three fatty acids bonded to a glycerol mo molecule, triglyceride. Now, your textbook also refers to a triglyceride as one called a triacylglycerol. That's also acceptable. And uh, the reason, in fact, the reason that we don't really adopt that triacylglycerol is because in the medical field, we often go and test for triglycerides in the blood. And that old name is hard to replace. So uh, we'll just stick with, uh, with triglyceride. But triacylglycerol is the one that your textbook uh, prefers. Now, we use dehydration synthesis as a way to go and join those fatty acids to the glycerol backbone. All right. So, a water has to be removed. You can see in this case, we have a hydrogen from glycerol and a hydroxyl group from the fatty acid. They form water, so that's a dehydration reaction, and it forms a strong covalent bond between the fatty acid and the glycerol. Now, if you recall, every single category of organic compounds, whether we're talking proteins or nucleic acids or lipids or our friends, the carbohydrates, they all have a specific name for the covalent bond that joins two monomers together. And we saw with carbohydrates, we call that a glycosidic linkage. In lipids, that is called an ester linkage or an ester bond. And that's what you're seeing there. That is called an ester linkage or an ester bond. Now, again, if we want to break that, and that's what happens in our intestines when we digest fats, is that water has to be replaced. In order to go and reform that hydroxyl group and give the hydrogen back to glycerol. So hydrolysis is the way to go and break that. So beautiful molecule. So the monomers, glycerol, and the fatty acids, and our polymer, triglyceride. Now, oftentimes we hear these two terms, fats and oils. The big difference is <clears throat> their physical consistency. When we look at a fat at room temperature, we're going to find that fats are going to be solid. Think about milk fats, all right? Particularly when we concentrate the milk fats, something like butter, right? We're going to find that that is a solid, a solid at room temperature. Animal fat. This is what makes meat so very tasty. Fat has a lot of flavor in it. Oftentimes, we'll add fat to things to make them taste better. All right, we do that in, here in the South. <laughs> we do that all the time. We like to go and add a lot of fat to our vegetables <laughs> and, uh, and things like that. So uh, it's going to be solid at room temperature. The other thing about a fat is the source. You'll notice that butter fat, milk fat, and animal fat all come from animals. That's generally where they come from. 
Oils, on the other hand, oils are going to be liquid at room temperature, generally going to be classified as liquid. We do have a couple of exceptions, and the source of these is going to come from plants. Now, if you think about what part of the plant is going to contain the oil, think seeds. Right? Not only is the mama plant packing a lunch for the embryo in the seed with starch, but also with oils, also in a little protein. So a lot of our oils come from the seeds of plants. Remember, fats are great for long-term storage. So you think about corn oil, right? peanut oil, safflower oil, canola oil, olive oil, right? sunflower oil, walnut oil, <laughs> right? all coming from plant sources and generally coming from the seeds. Now, in nutrition, we'll often hear a term uh, called saturated fats and unsaturated fats. We often hear, oh, this is rich in unsaturated fats, or watch out of those saturated fats over there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what those terms mean and what they refer to. We're going to first take a look at what we call an unsaturated fat. An unsaturated fat is going to be a liquid at room temperature. So when we look at our oils, we're going to find that the preponderance of neutral fats that's found in those plant oils is going to be an unsaturated fat. Now, what we mean by that is if we look at the fatty acid chains, in an unsaturated fat, we're going to find double bonds. Now, you might be looking at, at this little picture here and say, well, I see a double bond between a carbon and an oxygen. That does not count. The double bonds that I'm referring to in the fatty acids are between carbons. So look for the double bonds between the carbons. If there is a double bond there, all right, that tells you that that is an unsaturated fatty acid. Right? So if you look at that first fatty acid at the top, you can see, wow, there's, there's two double bonds. If you look at the one below, you can see two. If you look on the third one, you'll see three. Each one of those fatty acids, because it has a double bond, is called an unsaturated fatty acid. Right? Even the presence of just a single one makes it unsaturated. Now, if you look over to the right, next to the oil decanter, you'll notice one of the fatty acid chains. And when there is a double bond, you get a kink. Now, the thing about double bonds is this. Every time that you have a single covalent bond in a long chain like this, that acts as a joint. Think of a ball and socket joint like your, your shoulder. You can move it in 360 degrees. Right? So things with single covalent bonds in a fatty acid means that you've got a lot of movement that's possible. But when you have a double bond, it is like putting a splint on a joint. You immobilize the movement. You get a little kink, that thing cannot move around. You've stabilized that molecule. So that little part right there, you've lost a joint. All right? Now, it turns out because of that, at room temperature, these unsaturated fats are going to be liquid. Anytime that you have a double bond in a fatty acid chain, you're going to have a liquid. Right? Now, the reason we call it unsaturated 
When you say saturated, you mean something is filled. We can't add anything more to it. Everything is filled. And when we're referring to saturated, we're really looking at the number of hydrogens. Remember, any place that you have a double bond, that means that that carbon all right, could have bonded to another hydrogen, but it chose to bond to another carbon. So if you look at that top fatty acid, you can see, wow, we still have room for one, two, three, four more hydrogens. That means it's not saturated. It's like having four empty seats. We can still feed four more hydrogens in. This is why we call it unsaturated. Right? There's still room for some hydrogens. Now, that leads us to what a fat is. A fat is going to be have saturated fatty acids. And you'll notice when you look at it, you go, wow, there's no double bonds between the carbons at all. It's all single bonds. So every place that you could put a hydrogen, there is a hydrogen. So it is filled with hydrogen. So it is saturated with hydrogen. This is why we call it a saturated fat. And if you look at the individual fatty acids, we can say, oh, that's a saturated fatty acid. So if there is nothing but single bonds between the carbons, we say that's a saturated fatty acid. Now, why is it a solid? Remember, those things can move around. Every time that you have a single bond, that acts as a joint. And it turns out that these things like to wrap around each other. Because they move so much, they form a very, very entwined, right, enmeshed, compact molecule. And it's that enmeshed, compact molecule that translates as being a solid at room temperature. So, saturated fats and unsaturated fats. The reason that you often hear um, nutritional guidelines saying reduce your saturated fat intake is because the carbon to hydrogen bond that is found in a hydrocarbon has a lot of energy. That's why we use them for fossil fuels. They have a lot of energy in them. Right? And when you eat a saturated fat, you're going to have more energy. They're high in energy. Right? And high in energy can lead to, you know, problems with weight and stuff like that. Right? Okay. Now, we've looked at a variety of different oils. And you might be under the impression that they are just going to be one type of uh, fat. Turns out that oftentimes when we look at oils, there are a whole combination of saturated and unsaturated fats. Right. So let's take a look at the top one. That's olive oil. It's 10% saturated fat. That's amazing. You know, we usually think about that coming from animal fat as being purely saturated, but 10% of olive oil is saturated fat. Then you'll notice that most of it is what we call monounsaturated. Now, mono means one. And what we're talking about, when we look at a fatty acid that just has a single double bond between the carbons, then that's one. That's monounsaturated. So if you look at those triglycerides, you'll see that in the fatty acid chains, the fatty acids are monounsaturated. They just have one double bond. Now, when you have more than one, then we call that polyunsaturated. That means more than one. So, many. Right? Now, you'll notice that olive oil, which is rich in monounsaturated 
uh, fat, and we have about 8% polyunsaturated. Now, we often hear about polyunsaturated being less energy. That might be good. All right, a little bit more, well, uh, we like to use them too, uh, but one of the big problems with working with polyunsaturated fats is that they tend to be fairly unstable. Bacteria have a heyday with them and uh, will turn them rancid very quickly. So oftentimes uh, we add a preservative to processed foods that have polyunsaturated fats. So you may have seen BHA and BHT. Those are both uh, preservatives that help the, the prevention of rancidity in, uh, in uh, polyunsaturated fats. Uh, now, if we look at, for example, uh, let's take a look at, uh, oh, here's a good one. Safflower oil, clear down at the bottom, you see safflower oil. Safflower oil is 79% polyunsaturated. That one's very, very rich in polyunsaturated fats. All right, it's a lovely little oil. About 13% monounsaturated, and as you can see, it even has some saturated fatty acids, some saturated fats in it, 8%. But I want to point out two of them to you, and one is looking at what we call palm kernel oil and the other one is coconut oil. Now, if you've ever been to the grocery store, and uh, I usually have to go to a fancy one. So if I go up to, uh, to World Market or if I go to Publix, I can usually go and find that. And uh, you'll notice that if you look at, uh, at, for example, coconut oil, it's not an oil. You'll look at it, it's a big, it almost looks like Crisco. It's just this white mass that's solid. And there's a reason for that. Even though it comes from a plant, it is 92% saturated fat. That's the reason why it's solid. Right? That's the reason why it's solid. And look at palm kernel oil as well, 83. Right? Oftentimes, these are stuff additives. If you want to make something a little bit more solid, that's a little bit more liquid, a good way to do that is just to add a little bit of those to oils and stiffen things up. Now, I'm a big peanut butter fanatic. I just love peanut butter. Right? Uh, my favorite pie is peanut butter pie. My favorite milkshake is a peanut butter milkshake. My favorite ice cream, peanut butter ice cream. <laughs> in fact, I would love, if I ever have a chance to, uh, in fact, I need to write uh, Ben and Jerry's and haagen -Dazs and uh, Blue Bunny and Blue Bell and, and uh, <laughs> all those ice cream companies and say, please, if you would, don't put Reese's Cups in peanut butter ice cream. Just make it plain peanut butter. You know, I love Reese's Cups too, but combined with peanut butter ice cream, it's too rich. So if you would, just make plain peanut butter ice cream, I would be eternally uh, thankful for that. But if you go to the grocery store, you'll notice that there are uh, two strange types of peanut butter. And I'm not talking about creamy or chunky. I'm talking about natural peanut butter and regular peanut butter. Here's some smuckers. And you'll notice that this is called natural peanut butter. And you'll notice at the top, there's a layer of oil. Huh. Turns out that peanuts have a lot of unsaturated fats in them. So their fat is not a solid, it's a liquid. Now, if you've ever eaten natural peanut butter, you know that it's a little gross. It tastes great. But what you got to do is when you open it up, you have to stir in that oil. Or if you want it a little dry, you can pour the oil out. Right. Now, if you go and you just buy regular peanut butter, you'll notice that there's no oil to it. It's solid. And you think, huh, 
How did we go from natural peanut butter to this other peanut butter? Well, it turns out that they did a little food chemistry. Think about vegetable oil, right? plain old vegetable oil. Right? It's liquid. And then you think about Crisco, which is also oil. You go, how do you go from a liquid to a solid? Well, you do a little food chemistry. That vegetable oil is going to be a liquid, which means it's unsaturated. What if we added some hydrogens to those, broke some of those double bonds, added some hydrogens to it, and converted that to something solid, something that's a saturated fat? And that's where Crisco comes from. All right? We've taken a vegetable oil and we've turned it into a solid. We do that with margarine, too. Right? Right? And we do that with peanut butter. Right? We do a little process that's called hydrogenation. If you go and you look at the little uh, thing there, it says fully hydrogenated vegetable oils. All right? That's pretty amazing. So we actually go and take oils and we turn them into solids by adding hydrogen to them. That's the process of what we call hydrogenation. By breaking those double bonds and adding hydrogen to them, we turn a liquid into a solid. Same with margarine. If you look at margarine there, you know, we don't really want to go and pour <laughs> our margarine onto our toast in the morning. We want to spread it. All right. And so we hydrogenated. That's basically vegetable oil that we turned into a solid. The cool thing about it is it you know, improves the texture. It also betters the, the shelf life. I talked about how polyunsaturated um, fats are quite susceptible to rancidity. <clears throat> so it improves the shelf life. So we see this as a lot in processed foods. However, <clears throat> we do find that there is a kind of a nasty byproduct that occurs when we hydrogenate vegetable oils. Um, sometimes if you go to the grocery store, there's a lot of nutritional marketing that is found on packaging. And a common thing you'll see is contains no trans fats. You might be wondering, what the heck is a trans fat? I have no idea what a trans fat is. It must be bad. Well, in a sense it is. We find that diets that are rich in trans fats uh, increase your risk for heart disease and stroke. So, what is a trans fat? Turns out that when we look at an unsaturated fatty acid, and when we have a double bond, it forms a kink. All right, beautiful. It forms a beautiful little kink. All right. And if you look at that kink, you'll find that on one side of the double bond, you have the two hydrogens. That's beautiful. That's what produces the kink. Now, since they're on the same side, we call that cis. That's C-I-S. That's the cis form. Now, you'll notice that in the trans form, trans means a cross. Right? So you'll see that you have a hydrogen across from the other one. That's a transform. And you'll notice that we don't get a kink. And we don't get a kink. Right? So in this case, it looks like a saturated fatty acid. Right? But it kind of acts like an unsaturated fatty acid. Right? And that's what makes a trans fat. That's a trans fatty acid. Right? Remember, trans means a cross. So if you look at the bond, you'll see one hydrogen on one side, 
one hydrogen across the double bond on the other side. And again, a diet that is rich in these will increase your risk for heart disease. Okay, fats are remarkable in that they have a lot of energy. If we compare the amount of calories, and we're talking big C calories. In fact, when you go and you look at the calorie content of a food, you're really looking at a kilocalorie, thousand of you know, thousand calories. Right? So a kilocalorie, that's what those are. We find, for example, that a carbohydrate, that's what CHO stands for, a carbohydrate, right? So if we look at starch, if we look at sugar, we're going to find that that's about four kilocalories or four calories per gram. So if you have a gram of starch or a gram of sugar, that equals four calories of energy. The same goes for protein. If you have, and that's what the PRO stands for, if you have a gram of protein, that is going to be about four calories. Now look at fats. Fats are over double. You can see we have nine calories per gram. This is a highly concentrated form of energy. A lot more energy in a gram of fat than there is in a gram of carbs or a gram of protein. Now this is a beneficial thing. Imagine, now I'm a pretty fat guy, but imagine what my love handles would look like if I had to carry it around as a carbohydrate. It would be twice as big. Right? If you're an animal and you have to move around, this is a great way to store energy. This is more concentrated. When I go to the grocery store, I don't buy the regular laundry detergent, I buy the concentrated laundry detergent. I have to use less and it comes in a smaller bottle that doesn't fill up my closet. Right? In the same way, animals like to use fats. It's a great way to concentrate the energy and store it in a smaller space. Plus you get some cushioning, you get some insulation. Right? It's fantastic. Okay, we're gonna we finish with the neutral fats. We're gonna move on to another type of lipid that has some fantastic uh, biological ramifications. In fact, we're gonna spend later in the semester an entire lecture, all right, an entire unit just focused in on membranes because phospholipids is really what makes all the membranes inside of a cell, the outer boundary of a cell, and it's all built from this particular type of lipid called a phospholipid. Now, if you look at a phospholipid, you might recognize the parts of a triglyceride. You have a three-carbon glycerol backbone. So we've seen that molecule before. That's one of the monomers that we find in the neutral fats. It's also the little monomer that we find in a phospholipid. Now, this also looks like a triglyceride. It has two fatty acid chains. Two fatty acid chains. Right? And they're, they're held together to the glycerol by an ester linkage. Now, if you look at the fatty acid chains, you go, oh, well, let me look at that first one on the left. Well, I just see nothing but single bonds. That's got to be a saturated fatty acid, and you'd be exactly right. That's a saturated fatty acid. Look at the second one to the right. You look down, and all of a sudden you see a kink, and you go, oh, there's a double bond there. That must be unsaturated. Ah. Now, any time that you have an unsaturated fatty acid, that is going to make it a liquid. And it turns out phospholipids have the consistency of salad oil. They're a liquid at room temperature. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that, that blows me away every time I think about it. We have 37 trillion cells in our body. 
37 trillion. We just uh, came up with that number just a couple years ago. <laughs> 37 trillion. And every single cell, the outer boundary of that cell has the consistency of olive oil or salad oil. Isn't that amazing? And it's because of that, because of that one fatty acid chain that's unsaturated. Wow. Hmm. Now, you would expect to have a third fatty acid chain, but we have something else instead. Now, obviously, fatty acids, because they're hydrocarbons, are nonpolar. So we often describe them as hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means fear of water. So they're hydrophobic tails. They hate water. But you'll see that the third place where we should have another fatty acid chain is bonded to a phosphate group. Now, a phosphate group, as you can see, is the element phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens. And it turns out a phosphate group always has a negative charge. This is an ion. We call these ones that are more than one atom. We call it a polyatomic ion. More than one atom. Many atoms. All right? So a phosphate group. It's one of our functional groups. And it has a negative charge to it, which is weird because a normal triglyceride has no charge. Nothing sticks to it. That's why uh, they're nonpolar. That's why... Uh, uh, neutral fats don't mix with water. So, all of a sudden, now we have this strange lipid that has a nonpolar side and a charged side. So, one side hates water. The charged side loves water. So, you can see in the little figure to the right where it says hydrophilic head, Hydrophila means lover of water, right? So it loves water. Remember, water is polar, and it's attracted to anything with a charge. So this molecule has one side that hates water and one side that loves water. You also notice that there is a positively charged molecule attached to the phosphate group, and this one is called choline. Choline is a common biological molecule. We'll see it in two other places. There's a neurotransmitter that connects our nervous system to the, the muscles, and this is called acetylcholine. You see that choline there. Um, as well as when we go and talk a lot about how the mitochondria works, the mitochondria, as you remember from high school, the powerhouse of the cell, generates energy in the form of ATP, we'll see that, uh, that we actually have, um, well, I'm, I'm speaking out of turn here. <laughs> uh, ignore that little part. I had a little brain fart. Okay. Anyway, choline is a fairly common thing that we see in biology. And, and, and this one here is a nitrogen-containing compound that has a positive charge. And because it has a positive charge, it's also attracted to water. So those two molecules make up the hydrophilic head. All right. Now, phospholipids are important because when we place them in water, they make one of two structures. Let's look at the structures. Now, if there's a few of them, they will make a structure called a micelle. And that's the one at the top. Now, in cells and outside of cells in the body, everything's surrounded by water. Right? So inside your cell is mostly water. Outside your cell is mostly water. You know, between cells, mostly water. So when we go and have a micelle, all right, when we have that in water, it will go and the phospholipids will form this beautiful ring. In fact, in three dimensions, it is a ball. 
And as you can see, we have the hydrophilic heads around the outside, which are attracted to the water, and the hydrophobic tails, the nonpolar tails, because of hydrophobic exclusion, all right, are facing inward. To me, it often reminds me of uh, uh, what musk oxen do. Musk oxen, when they're threatened by wolves, think about the wolves as being water molecules, will go and form a circle, just like that, with their heads out. All right? And so they can protect their, their hindquarters, they can protect any kind of little um, young in the center. All right? And it's a very, very effective effective defense against wolves is to form this circle. Now, if we have a lot of phospholipids, then it will form a thing called a bilayer. Bi just means two. Two layers. And as you can see, that we have water on both sides. The hydrophilic heads point out toward the water and the hydrophobic tails point inward. That phospholipid bilayer is found everywhere. The important thing is if you look at a cell, and cells have huge amounts of membranes. Think about the, the membrane that surrounds the DNA that makes the nucleus in a cell. If you remember from high school, you might remember the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the food vacuoles, the central vacuoles, the little vesicles, they're all membranes, and they're all built from these phospholipid bilayers. This is a great picture. In fact, this is from a powerful electron microscope called a transmission electron microscope. You can always tell them because they're just in two dimensions. These come from flat sections. They cut a little section, and then uh, you'll see it. And uh, what you're looking at is actually the inside and outside of a cell. So this is really tiny. In fact, look at the scale, 0.1 micrometer. That's a thousandth of a millimeter. And so that distance right there is 10 thousandths of a millimeter. That's really, really tiny. A millimeter, if you look at a metric ruler, it's just those tiny little hash marks. So that's 10 thousandth of that. That's tiny. And as you can see, you can see the phospholipid bilayer. That's wild. That's absolutely wild that we can see it. And embedded within that membrane are all these great little proteins. And those proteins are great because they can move around they do dozens of different things. In fact, in a typical red blood cell, we find about 50 different types of what we call transmembrane proteins that are founded in that membrane. Now, the great thing about a phospholipid bilayer, and the reason that life uses it, is it's selective. Turns out there are certain things that can pass through that membrane, but it also goes and blocks things. It acts as sort of the perfect bouncer, all right? It allows some people into the, the bar or the dance club and prevents the entrance of the riffraff, the troublemakers. And that is what we find in our cells. Every bit of our 37 trillion cells all have a boundary that's built from a phospholipid bilayer. All the membranes inside those cells are all built from this same lipid. So that's why we, we, we love phospholipids. Absolutely love them. Okay, the last group I'm going to talk about are the steroids. Steroids, as you see from their structures, have very little in common structural-wise compared to a triglyceride. You don't see any glycerol, you don't see any fatty acid chains, but they share the insolubility in water. These are fairly, for the most part, just carbons and hydrogens, so they're fairly nonpolar. They're 
pretty much insoluble in water. Their big structure that unites the steroids are going to be the four fused carbon rings. They have a backbone, and every steroid has these. It has this central core of four fused carbon rings. What makes them different are little side chains that come off from those rings. That's what makes one steroid different from another. Now, we often hear a lot about steroids in sports and athletics. Right. Steroids turn out to be uh, important in hormones. In fact, uh, when we hear the word anabolic steroids, we're really usually thinking about testosterone. Testosterone is a type of steroid. Right. And it's the one that causes the muscles to be big. It masculinizes the body and so on and so forth. Right. But I would argue that even though we hear a lot about that, to me, the most important steroid is this one right here, cholesterol. Now you might be thinking, ah, I've heard cholesterol before. This is what they check in your blood. And if you have too high of cholesterol, you're at higher risk of, of heart disease and stroke. Well, you're right about that, but cholesterol plays some very, very important roles in our body. So I want to tell you four reasons why you should love cholesterol. Right? Four reasons you should love cholesterol. Now, if you look at cholesterol, you'll notice it has those beautiful four fused carbon rings. You'll notice it has some hydrocarbons coming out. You'll see the CH3, that, remember, is called a methyl group. So we have a methyl group. We have, almost looks like a fatty acid chain coming off the top there. But you'll notice one little happy thing. They have one tiny little polar group to it. You see that hydrophilic head way down that hydroxyl group right there? Turns out that's useful, very useful. Because in cholesterol, especially if we look at animal cell membranes, animal cell membranes have embedded between the phospholipids and the phospholipid bilayer cholesterol. All right. Now, plants also have a similar type. It's uh, called a plant sterol. All right. We'll find it in bacteria as well. And they, they pretty much do the same thing. But animals, animal cell membranes, use cholesterol. And it's found in the phospholipid bilayer. And it does a very, very important job for animals. It turns out that this phospholipid bilayer, as I mentioned, phospholipids has the consistency of salad oil. This is oftentimes why we describe the phospholipid bilayer as a fluid. Because it is a fluid, those phospholipids can move around. Uh, they can spin around. They can move laterally. They occasionally will flip. They'll go and they'll, you know, go from one layer to the other layer. Now, when you have a, a membrane that is very, very fluid, it doesn't act as a very good selective bouncer. Right. doesn't act as a very good checkpoint. That means a lot more things than you want actually can get through. You create a loose border. So, oftentimes what we want to do is we want to toughen up that border. We want to build up that bouncer to be more selective. Right. And that's what cholesterol does. By bonding in the phospholipid bilayer, it actually goes and keeps the phospholipid bilayer more solid, less liquid. And because of that, it becomes more difficult, more impermeable to certain types of molecules and ions.
So it toughens up the membrane, makes it a lot more solid than it would be otherwise, and more selective to let things go through. So here's a nice little picture, and as you can see, look at where the hydroxyl group is. It's up near the hydrophilic head. It helps keep it in place. Isn't that wonderful? Now, there's a second benefit to that, and that is it prevents the phospholipid bilayer from turning solid at low temperatures. Let me describe something to you. If you take, for example, uh, a bottle of oil, let's say you have some olive oil or some canola oil, and you stick it in the refrigerator, what's going to happen to that oil? It's going to solidify. This is why we say that oils are liquid at room temperature, but they are going to go solid if you get them cold. Well, the same thing would happen with a membrane. A phospholipid bilayer, if you got it cold, would turn solid, and then nothing could get through. Nothing could get through. It'd be an impermeable wall. So, one of the functions of cholesterol is to actually go and keep the membrane fluid at low temperatures. And how it does that is the cholesterol prevents the phospholipids from packing too closely, too close together. So it spreads them out. And by spreading them out, it keeps them from turning into a solid. So the cool thing about cholesterol is in animal cell membranes and the phospholipids, it prevents it. It's an antifreeze. Right. Just like the antifreeze, you know, analogous to the antifreeze we put in our radiators. We don't want, you know, that water in there to turn solid and break the radiator and crack our engine. Right. We want it to actually stay as a liquid. And at body temperature, we want that membrane to be a little more solid. And just like antifreeze, it prevents it from boiling over. So in that case, that's the cool thing about cholesterol. At body temperature, it keeps that a little bit more solid, a little bit less fluid. But at low temperatures, that cholesterol keeps it fluid instead of turning into a solid. Isn't that wonderful? Turns out cholesterol is a precursor for making some really, really important molecules. And we're going to talk about some of these little molecules. Right. Cholesterol is the principal component and the precursor molecule for making a very, very important part of our digestion. Now, your liver secretes a greenish-yellow fluid that drains down a duct and eventually drains into the first part of your small intestine. That greenish-yellow fluid is called bile. You've probably heard of bile before. If you've ever wondered what the heck does bile do, inside bile is a molecule or a group of molecules derived from cholesterol that emulsify fats. So here's a nice little picture. Here is the liver. You can see what we call the bile duct. That's that tube that drains the liver and eventually goes and makes its way to the first part of the small intestine, which we call the duodenum. just comes right off the stomach there. If we have an excess amount of bile, which is constantly being made, uh, it gets stored in the gallbladder. And the gallbladder absorbs a lot of the fluid and kind of turns that bile into more of a syrup. Now, this is what bile looks like. This is a beautiful little picture. You can see this greenish yellow fluid. That's bile. That's uh, looking into a small intestine. Now, what is the function of that bile? Well, that bile 
has within it a derivative of cholesterol that can break down fat globules. Now, it's not an enzyme, all right? It doesn't go and break apart the neutral fats. What it does is oftentimes fats will clump together. There's that hydrophobic exclusion again into these big globules. And it's difficult for the enzymes, the lipases as we call them, to go and break that down. So what these bile acids do is it takes these large fat globules and breaks them down into smaller fat globules. And that makes it easier and more efficient for the lipases to break them down. So this is actually what cholesterol goes to make. It makes what are called the bile acids. And here's our little bile acids. You'll notice that it looks very similar to cholesterol. In fact, you might notice that it's changed a couple of those little side chains. We've added a few more. But in this case, it actually goes and acts as an emulsifier. And that's what emulsification is. Emulsifiers go and take fat globules and break them down into smaller fat globules. We often go and add uh, emulsifiers and things like salad dressing and ice cream. And what that does is it takes those big fat chunks, breaks it down into smaller fat chunks that give us a better, smoother, creamier mouthfeel. Okay. So here's a great little picture. You can see our bile salt has a hydrophilic side, has a hydrophobic side, so the hydrophobic side will bond to the fat, fat globule. And then, of course, the hydrophilic side bonds to water, and it pulls out those little fats. And we get an emulsification, which makes it much easier for the enzymes to digest them. Just to show you how important the bile is, if you didn't have bile, all right, your stools would be gray in color, and they would have large fatty streaks in them. And you think, okay, I understand the fatty streaks because of the emulsification. But why would they be gray? Why wouldn't they be normally brown? It turns out that in bile, that greenish-yellow pigment, right, which is actually a breakdown product of a protein called hemoglobin that transports oxygen and CO2 in your red blood cells, um, actually gets recycled. And it is what gives bile its greenish yellow color. Once it gets to the large intestine, uh, bacteria convert that into a brown pigment. And that's what gives our stools a brown pigment. It comes from something in bile. So, very, very important thing for digestion, these beautiful bile acids. Now, turns out that cholesterol is a precursor for a very, very important vitamin. We have a vitamin, in fact, it's what we call one of our fat-soluble vitamins. And it's absolutely necessary because it signals it signals the small intestine to absorb calcium. Calcium, as you know, is so important for the body. It builds bones. We need it for nerve and muscle contractions. We need it for proper gland secretions. We need it to clot our blood. So we have to have a certain level of calcium in our blood at any given time. We saw with blood sugar that's about 90. Calcium is about 10 milligrams for every 100 milliliters. So we have to keep a constant, constant calcium levels. So we have a vitamin called vitamin D. And vitamin D is important because it stimulates the intestines to absorb calcium. Calcium from our diet, so it can go and build bone and have nerve impulses and muscle contractions and all that good stuff. Now, without that vitamin D, if we have a deficiency in that vitamin D, one of the big signs is a malformation, particularly in kids, a malformation of the bones. You get bow-leggedness, you get a deformed 
pelvis, and that's what we call rickets. In fact, here's some pictures of some Paris kids who <coughs> have a vitamin D deficiency, and you can see how bow-legged they are. Now, it turns out this can be life-threatening in a sense because... Not only does it change or malform the legs, but it also malforms the pelvis. And it's hard enough to get the head of a baby and the body of a baby to go out through the birth canal. Imagine trying to do that with a deformed pelvis. I would imagine that a lot of those poor women who suffered from a vitamin D deficiency died in childbirth. So... This is something that is selected against big time. Now, how do we get vitamin D? It turns out cholesterol is, is transformed into a pro-hormone, a vitamin D pro-hormone, and it only becomes activated when it is exposed to ultraviolet light. So it's in our skin. Now, we have a balance. It's an uneasy balance. Right? We know that ultraviolet light can cause genetic mutations, right? That's why tanning is a really terrible idea because a tan is your body's response, your skin's response to damaged DNA. Right? But that's not really the problem. We find out that ultraviolet light from sunlight can also damage a very important other vitamin called folate or folic acid. And folic acid and folate is so important, absolutely necessary for cell division. So if it's damaged, you have problems with growth. So you have this big problem. Think of it as a teeter-totter or seesaw. Right? On one side, you need ultraviolet light, sunlight, to make vitamin D. And on the other side, if you get too much, then you damage folate and folic acid, which is necessary for cell division. So you have to have a certain balance. Now, if you go to the equator of the world, you're going to find that the native peoples there are very dark skinned. That's melanin. Right? They get lots of sunlight. So they're at a balance. But we know if we went back 150,000 years, Humans, which originated in East Africa, started moving out. And as they moved south and they moved north, they started entering areas where the light wasn't as much. The amount of ultraviolet light declined with latitude. So if you were the same color, all right, you were protected for the folic acid, but you started having deficiencies in vitamin D. And remember, vitamin D deficiency le leads to deformed pelvis. That's a huge selection pressure. So random mutations, which occur all the time, happen to occur in the melanin production, in the melanocytes. And those cells, instead of making normal black melanin, started making yellow melanin, which is called pheomelanin. And pheomelanin is the one that gives us fair skin. And so in upper latitudes, we start to get that balance back. By having fairer skin, you're now making enough vitamin B, but it's dark enough to protect your folic acid. Mm -hmm. So cholesterol, incredibly important for vitamin D production. Now, the last one I want to show you is that cholesterol is absolutely important because it's the precursor to all the steroid hormones. Now, most hormones are proteins. Most hormones are proteins. We saw insulin and glucagon. We could talk about human growth hormone, thyroid hormone. All right. But some of our hormones are actually made from lipids, and the precursor for all steroid hormones is cholesterol. Here you have a nice little picture. You can recognize a lot of the names of these. For example, there's testosterone, 
There's estradiol, which is a type of estrogen. There's cortisone, cortisol. There's aldosterone. There's dihydrotestosterone. Right? So lots and lots and lots of different steroid hormones. And as you can see, they all are derived from cholesterol. So let's talk about five of these steroid hormones. Of course, we know the sex hormones. All right. We have testosterone, which is the male hormone. And as you can see, it has the same structure, the four fused carbon rings. Estrogen, beautiful, four fused carbon rings. And progesterone. Progesterone is secreted by the ovary to sustain the endometrium of the uterus just in case there's an implantation by a fertilized egg. It sustains the pregnancy, what we call progesterone. Now, those are our sex hormones, but we also have some hormones that come from a strange little gland that's found on top of the kidneys, and this is called the adrenal glands. Now, Think about the word renal. That refers to kidneys, right? Ad means toward. So literally, toward the kidneys. These sit atop the kidneys. And as you can see, they have two layers. We have an outer layer, which we call a cortex. Cortex translates as bark, right? So the outer layers, and then a little medulla on the inside. Turns out we have two important steroid hormones that come from that adrenal cortex. They are, whoops, whoops, let me back up here. They are cortisol. Cortisol has two important roles. Number one, it is a stress hormone. So when we're under long-term stress, our bodies, our adrenal glands go and secrete cortisol. And what cortisol does is it raises our blood sugar up, right? So we have plenty of energy to deal with that stress. Now, when I talk about long-term stress, think about, for example, a sickness in the family and you're having to act as a caretaker. Or let's say that you're going through a divorce or a breakup, right? Or let's say that you're moving, right? Or that you're looking for a job. Right? Those can be long-term stressors, and cortisol helps us with that. The other thing cortisol does is it is an anti-inflammatory hormone. So when we have an inflammatory response, oftentimes cortisol will dampen that down. This is oftentimes when we go and give somebody a steroid if they have inflammation, or they have a strong immune response, one of our treatments is to give them a steroid, things like prednisone and stuff like that. Now, aldosterone is also very important. Aldosterone, which is also secreted by that, actually helps keep our blood volume and our blood pressure normal. So, when our blood volume drops, that often happens when we're dehydrated, aldosterone is released and it is specific on sodium. And what it does is it targets the kidneys to absorb more water. By absorbing sodium, water follows. It's like a groupie. <laughs> Anywhere sodium goes, water likes to follow. So as sodium goes and gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream, the water that's in the kidneys, rather than being emptied as urine, goes back to the bloodstream and raises the blood pressure, raises the blood volume. It's a very, very important hormone. And it's all derived from cholesterol. Okay, that's pretty much all we have on lipids. We'll go ahead and stop here. And our next topic will be on proteins. So we'll see you then.